What's going on guys? I am Dr. Jason Bullock and today we're going to talk about 10 tips that you can use to improve the way that you like your... Oh, come on. So if you think about a typical composite restorative procedure, there's a lot of steps there and there's many opportunities for things to go wrong. I mean, just think about it. Everything from isolation, prep design, how you use your dent and bonding agent, how you place your composite, how you light like cure your composite. Those are just a few examples of how certain steps along the way could inadvertently affect the outcome of your dentistry. And one of the most important steps that we probably overlook from time to time is the light curing step. And honestly, when I talk to providers or if I observe providers, I observe assistants doing the light curing step, there's many opportunities for improvement. And so we're gonna to talk today about 10 ways that we can improve that process and get better outcomes with our dentistry by improving that one step alone. You know, a lot of the problems we see today with resin composites and many of the reasons why sometimes resin composites get a bad name could be inadvertently related to the fact that they're under cured. And that is really kind of on us at the end of the day to make sure that we're completing the manufacturing process of our materials. When we under cure our composites, that leads to reduced bond strengths to the tooth, increased risk of fracture, increased wear, and a lot of the chemicals within the composite itself are more easily lost or leached out of the composite when it's under cured. All right, so tip number one, beware of the blue light. Now we're all guilty of this. We find ourselves glancing at the light from time to time to make sure it's working, to make sure it's properly positioned. Every time we look at that light, we're increasing the risk and the chances of damage. Now, maybe one exposure, you look at the light for a few seconds, that one time is not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but it's the collective exposures over a period of time, chronic exposures that can lead to issues. By looking directly at the blue light, you actually increase the chances of retinal burning and increase the long-term exposure where you could get chronic age-related degeneration. Let's say that you glance at that light a few times a day. Even up to seven glances of that light per day actually exceeds the maximum recommended dosage of blue light exposure for a given day. So the take home message here is do not look at the blue light. Make sure you're using some type of protective shield, whether it's blue light blocker glasses or some type of blue light blocker mounted on your curing light. Now, unfortunately, many of the curing lights have the orange blue light blocker that's really not big enough to protect the assistant and the dentist. So whoever is operating the curing light needs to be the one who actually uses that blue light blocker. The other person should just look away so you're not getting exposure to the light. Tip number two for better light curing is use an LED curing light. The technology in curing lights is so much greater than it used to be. And LED curing lights are really the top of the line curing lights on the market. These curing lights are lightweight, they have good battery life. You can actually take them from room to room. And the features on a lot of these lights are amazing for the day-to-day -day things that you're doing in your office. The latest generations of LED curing lights are what's called polywave or multi-wave, meaning that they're broad spectrum curing lights. They have an opportunity to cure way more photo initiators than a curing light that has a very narrow spectrum. All right, tip number three is use a curing light that has a large diameter light tip. So when I say a large diameter tip, it means something greater than 10 millimeters. If your tip of your curing light is less than 10 millimeters, this means that you're gonna take longer to cure your restorations, especially if they're larger restorations. You'll actually have to do multiple overlapping cures to ensure that you're getting complete cure throughout the entire restoration. And you may have a high output curing light, and that's great, but if the diameter of the tip is small, you're still gonna have to overlap your exposures to ensure that you're getting 
complete cure of the restoration. Check out this diagram where you have on one side a very large diameter tip that covers the entire tooth. On the opposite side, you can tell that the light tip is a lot smaller. So to ensure that you get the box of that preparation and the occlusal part of the preparation cured, you're gonna have to do at least two overlapping exposures. Tip number four, be aware of hot spots. What do we mean by hot spots? We're actually talking about light uniformity. When you look at your curing light, there's gonna be a reported irradiance or a reported output. That output that's reported from the company is a average over the entire surface of that curing light tip. Across that curing light tip, there's gonna be areas of that tip that are of high irradiance or what we call hot spots. And there's gonna be areas where there's lower irradiance or cold spots where not as much energy is being put out at that specific location. So it's important when you're looking for LED curing light or if you're using an LED curing light, you need to understand the beam profile, which shows you kind of where the hot spots are located and where the cold spots are located. And know that you may have to do multiple overlapping exposures or different angles of curing. Take a look at this graph where it actually shows you a beam profile. And on the far left is the beam profile as if you were looking straight down the light tip. You can tell it's circular in nature. And in the middle column, you can see a three-dimensional view of that beam profile. And you can tell that the areas that are orange to red represent hot spots, and the areas that are kind of blue or teal represent cold spots. So you can see that with some curing lights, there are areas where there's not much energy being released at that light tip. Here's another diagram where it shows you the diameter over a tooth. And you can tell that just in that one specific angle or that one specific position of holding the curing light, that there are areas of the tooth that are receiving high amounts of energy and there are areas of the tooth receiving low amounts of energy. So it's important to understand the beam profile of your curing light so you understand where the hot spots are located and this can influence how you actually cure the restoration. In addition to this concept of hot spots, if you know certain parts of your preparation are receiving less energy, that may also be an indication to have longer curing times or longer exposures on the tooth. And that ensures that you're delivering a low amount of energy over a longer period of time, more likely leading to increased depth of cure. Tip number five is frequently monitor your light output. Lights tend to degrade over time, meaning that they're gonna lose the amount of energy they put out from the light over time. So it's important that in your office you have a dental radiometer to measure that light output on a regular basis so you can understand how well your light is performing. If you're looking at getting a radiometer, make sure you buy a radiometer that allows you to place the entire tip of your light onto the radiometer. Here's an example of some radiometers that you could have in your practice. On the far left, there is the Ivoclar blue phase meter. That one actually has a very large surface area for measuring from your light tip. You can tell if you compare that to the radiometer in the middle, the LED radiometer, that the surface area for measuring there is very small. So that one could lead to some inaccuracies because it's only measuring part of that beam profile compared to if you were measuring the entire light tip at the surface, so get an average reading. Now the radiometer tells you what the radiance is from the curing light. Now, I stumbled across probably about two years ago what's called the check mark system. And this is a little bit different type of measuring apparatus. This is actually a spectrometer. A spectrometer contains a prism that splits the wavelengths of light, whereas a radiometer only tells you the output of your light at zero millimeters. However, with the spectrometer, you can actually take measurements of your curing light at zero meters and at six millimeters. And if you think about it, more often we're using curing lights at a greater distance than zero millimeters. So the six millimeter measurement is probably gonna give you a more accurate representation of how much light is reaching your restoration. Now, another cool thing about the checkmark system is it allows you to compare your curing lights output to the curing lights manufacturer's intended output. So you can tell if your curing light is comparing well to the manufacturer's output or if it's underperforming 
or if it's overperforming. And probably my favorite part about the checkmark system is you can actually get measurements from the company that tells you for your specific curing light how long you need to cure materials that you use in your office. So it really helps you dial in your curing times. Let's be honest, many of us will cure stuff until it just feels right, right? Yeah, I think I cured that long enough, but we never know for sure, you know? Uh, sometimes the, the material will say cure for this amount of time, sometimes the curing light will say something different. But the check mark system will actually tell you for your curing light, make sure you cure this specific material for this amount of time. The check mark system is offered by 3M. They'll come to your office and measure your curing lights for you, and then they send that report to Blue Light Analytics. They, in turn, will run a report on your curing light and then give you the report back a few days later. I'll take that report and I'll actually place it in the operatory right there where if we ever have a question about oh we're using this material how long am i supposed to cure this for oh okay five seconds it's right there in front of you so you don't have to guess and you can really streamline and know that your curing times are now a little bit more objective than they used to be tip number six is do not cook the pulp now if you're using a high output curing light something greater than a thousand milliwatts you're going to have a higher chance of cooking the pulp and this is going to be even more dangerous or likely if you're curing into a deep restoration. Let's say you're trying to cure a liner on the floor right above the pulp chamber. That is going to expose that pulp to a high amount of energy. So you need to be careful in those situations. So a couple of recommendations for minimizing this is one, you could have your assistant or yourself blast a stream of air on the surface of the tooth while you're curing that helps kind of dissipate some of the heat that's on the surface of the tooth another option is you could take a two second break in between each 10 second curing time and that again will allow some of that heat to dissipate between curing cycles and hopefully minimize the risk of potential pulp damage tip number seven is to remember that faster curing times does not always equal better outcomes right now we're at the mercy of some of the manufacturers and a lot of the manufacturers are pushing faster curing times you know it's like you can do this in two seconds you can do this in three seconds but keep in mind that if you look at the literature on curing it doesn't always recommend faster curing times in fact the literature actually talks about how faster curing times could actually lead to less than ideal physical and mechanical properties of your composite restorations. When we blast a composite with a high amount of energy from a curing light, we're forcing a reaction to occur within that composite in a very short amount of time. And if you think about it, all the different molecules in the composite are trying to link up with each other. Would you rather have your composite link up within two seconds in a kind of chaotic fashion just where it's just kind of grabbing molecules as quick as it can because of the high amount of energy coming out of your curing light or would you rather have your composite kind of link up in a more systematic kind of controlled manner where you can get more complete polymerization throughout the composite that's really kind of what we're talking about here is having more complete polymerization throughout the composite when you hit that composite with a high amount of energy in a short amount of time, you're really forcing that polymerization to occur in a super fast manner where there's a lot of stress created within the composite and at the surface of the composite tooth interface, but you're also forcing those molecules to link up so fast it may not completely polymerize throughout the composite at a higher rate. So what's often recommended in the literature is to do soft starts or to use lower amounts of energy over a longer period of time. That allows the molecules to link up a little bit slower in a more controlled fashion, thereby giving you higher amounts of polymerization throughout the material itself. And that's gonna be important because that's gonna to correspond to depth of cure and the properties of your composite. How strong your composite's gonna be, how well it's adapted, you know, all these different things that kind of affect negative outcomes, they're gonna be related to the amount of polymerization throughout that composite. Tip number eight for curing is properly position your curing light. 
Now when you place your curing light over the tooth, you want it to be directly over the material that you're curing. You also would like it to be perpendicular to the surface and as close to that material as possible. Now the perpendicular angulation is important because as you deviate from perpendicular, you're going to actually reduce the amount of light intensity and reduce the amount of depth of cure that you're obtaining in your restoration because of lost amount of output. So directly perpendicular over that tooth is going to give the greatest amount of output from the surface. And this is one of those things where if you're looking for a curing light, you want to look at those angles at the light tip and understand how easy or how hard it's going to be to get into certain spots of the mouth and cure. You know, that could influence what light you purchase if you're going to have a harder time curing certain areas of the mouth. Tip number nine for better curing is you need to consider using supplementary buccal and lingual light cures. Now what does that mean? Normally we start by curing the tooth from the occlusal surface. However, especially when you're doing restorations or you're curing any material that could be spilling over to the buccal or to the lingual of the tooth, or say you're curing a MO or a DO restoration. You really need to cure that restoration from the buccal and lingual surfaces as well. That will give you a different angle of cure and that will allow you to hopefully reach some of those deeper areas of the preparation a little bit easier. All right, tip number 10 and the last tip I'm gonna give you today is you need to train your staff. Really? That's a tip, right? No, but listen, they've done studies on this and they've actually shown that curing a restoration is not as simple as just pointing the light at the restoration and expecting good results. You need to understand what you're doing and you need to incorporate a lot of the things we've already discussed. And so training your staff in the things that we've already discussed will give them a mindset of being more aware of what they're doing when they're actually doing patient care and they're gonna be more likely to pay attention to those details. And I guarantee you, if they're paying attention to those details and they understand why they are doing them, you're gonna get better outcomes with your light curing and with your dentistry. So that is the 10 tips for better light curing. All right guys, if you found this video useful and you liked it, please hit the like button. If you have not subscribed to this channel, what are you waiting for? If you like dentistry, if you do dentistry, if you're part of dentistry, you're going to learn things from this channel. That's kind of the goal of this channel. So please subscribe and I'll see you next time.